For now, let's turn the corner on our initial discovery tour and touch on c -sharp support for multi-paradigm programming. Consider again our simplistic array of numbers program. To demonstrate C-sharp's inherent object-orientedness, I'm going to forego defining some sort of base class and derived class hierarchy, and again, leave that to other courses in the library. Instead, I'll simply point out that, at some point, every type in C-sharp derives from, or extends, a standard .NET type named system.object, which, among other things, provides a method named getType that you can use at runtime to ask any object for information about its type. This is done by calling the getType method, which we leveraged in an earlier demo. Having done that, we can display the name of the object to the console by accessing its full name property, which in this case turns out to be a type called system.int32 with array brackets after it. This denotes it's an array of 32-bit signed integers. This is an example of a C-sharp language keyword or construct being mapped to a standard type in the .NET base class library, which is another way that C-sharp endeavors to be approachable to programmers familiar with other C-based programming languages. There are numerous such language mappings in C-sharp. We can also go one step further. As it turns out, not only can we use our type reference to determine the name of this type, we can also use the base type property of any object to determine whether that type derives from or extends some other type. And if we do this in a loop like so, we can walk the entire inheritance tree until we reach the root of our numbers arrays type hierarchy, which, when run, would produce this output. I'll include references to additional courses on C Sharp's type system and object oriented nature at the end of this module. For now, let's examine what I mean by with functional features. Let's return to the original version of our array of numbers program, which computed and then displayed the sum of the integers within the array. Our original implementation used a standard for loop to iterate over each element of the array, adding the current array element's value to the running tally being stored in the sum variable. While this is a perfectly functional way to implement this algorithm, pun intended, c -sharp also allows developers to embrace, if they choose, a more functional programming paradigm. In functional programming languages, executable expressions, or functions, are first-class entities within the syntax of the language, and can be treated like any other typed object, including being referenced by variables and passed into and out of other functions as parameters and return values. In c -sharp, the functional equivalent of the previous implementation would look like this. Instead of writing a traditional for loop, we would instead simply invoke an aggregate method on our array of numbers. The aggregate method takes two parameters as input. The first parameter is simply the initial value of our accumulator, which in our case is just zero. The second parameter is an expression of the function we would like the aggregate method to invoke for each element in the numbers array. If you look up the documentation for the aggregate method, you'll find that there are three elements to this expression. A parameter list expression, followed by a fat arrow operator, and then the set of statements we would like to execute for each element in the input array. Together, this line of code forms what c -sharp refers to as an expression lambda. The documentation for the aggregate method indicates that it will call our functional expression with two input arguments. The first being the current value of the accumulator, and the second being the value of the current element in the input array. While the order of those parameters is defined by the aggregate function, we can name those parameters anything we like. In this case, total and num are apt names for those two arguments. The body of our anonymous method then simply returns the result of adding the current value to the running total. Since our anonymous method consists of just a single statement, we don't need to actually use the return keyword. It's implied in this case. And since this syntax is really just shorthand for defining an anonymous method that contains the required parameter list and a method body that contains whatever it is you want to execute, should you need to do something involving multiple statements, you can use a standard pair of curly braces to denote the collection of statements you would like to comprise that anonymous method. Note that when using this variation, which is officially referred to as a statement lambda, the return keyword is required. This is because the code within the curly braces can be arbitrarily complex, including the use of multiple return statements. So the compiler will no longer assume which statement should result in the return value for the functional expression. 
Now, I'm glossing over quite a bit of detail here, but the aggregate method shown here is actually defined in another namespace called system.link, where link is actually an acronym that stands for Language Integrated Query. Link is beyond the scope of this course, but I'll include a reference at the end of this module to a course on link that you can check out to learn more.